Hey, what's going on everybody? It's ETA Prime back here again with the all new 2022 Samsung Galaxy Tab A8 10.5. I've had a bunch of viewers asking about this tablet, so I figured I'd go ahead and pick one up and take a look at it. And this is their newest 10.5 inch budget offering. I've seen these going for $200 up to $260, depending on the storage variant. And with the storage variant, it's also going to change up the RAM a bit. They also offer a few different colors, but I opted for the silver version. We've got a 10.5 inch display, quad speakers, Android 11, and we'll get into the full specs in a second. But along with the tablet, inside of the box, you're also going to receive a user manual. You'll get your USB Type-C charging cable and a 2 amp power supply. When it comes down to it, this is priced right around where the Amazon Fire 10 tablet is priced right now, at least the Plus version with 4 gigabytes of RAM. But instead of running Fire OS, this is running Android 11 with One UI 3. Taking a look around the tablet, this does support a micro SD card, and I've personally tested a 400 gigabyte card, but they claim a 1 terabyte will also work. This tablet also has quad speakers built in, and it does get really loud. I've always been a big fan of these Galaxy Tab speakers that Samsung has added. So over here, we've got two of our speakers. On the other side, we have our USB Type-C port, our other two speakers, and they've also left the 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. It also has a fingerprint sensor, which doubles as our power button. Plus, we have our volume control over here, and around back, we have an 8 megapixel camera. So when it comes to the specs of the new Tab A8 10.5, Samsung opted for a totally different chip, and we've actually seen this on some Chinese tablets. They didn't go Snapdragon, they didn't go MediaTek, they didn't even go Exynos. What we have here is a Unisoc Tiger T618. Eight cores up to two gigahertz. The GPU is the Mali G52 MP2. You can get this in a couple different variants with three to four gigabytes of RAM and 32 gigabytes of storage up to 128. We've got those quad speakers, AC Wi-Fi, Bluetooth 5.1, a 10.5 inch TFT display at 1200 by 1920, and uh, just doesn't look as good as an IPS. 7,040 milliamp hour battery with 15 watt quick charging capabilities, and it's running Android 11 with One UI 3. All right, so here we are, and overall UI performance seems really snappy. I kind of figured it would be. They do a lot of optimizations, and this Unisoc SoC, I mean, isn't a slouch. It's definitely not the fastest chip on the market, but it does work great for tablets, especially media playback. In 2021, we saw a bunch of tablets powered by the same chip, and I was actually surprised to see that Samsung jumped on board with this. And when it comes to those tablets, one of the main things they always lack is widevine support, which is basically DRM for HD content. With the new Galaxy Tab A8, we do have level one, so we can get HD content from our favorite streaming apps. So we do have widevine support here, and even though we don't have the highest resolution display on this unit, things like Netflix do work in HD, and it's just a big plus when it comes to a bigger screen tablet. So we've basically got the full tablet version of Netflix instead of the phone version. And from here, we can do 1080p playback from our favorite shows and movies. And when it comes to video playback, this actually does a pretty decent job at 1080p. We'll head over to YouTube real quick. And from here, I've just got a 1080p 60 video. Stats for Nerds is on screen. And by the end of this, we did have 12 drop frames, but it's really not that bad. It's something you'd never notice unless you had Stats for Nerds on screen. So when it comes to the Tab A8 for 1080p 60 playback, it's going to handle it just fine. That Unisoc CPU does have more than enough power for video playback. Another thing I always like to do when testing these devices is run a couple benchmarks. And first up, we have Geekbench 5, Single Core, 361, Multi, 1227. So it's actually not looking that great. We are getting a lot of prepaid $99 phones with the MediaTek Dimensity 700 chip, and it will outperform this Unisoc CPU. The other benchmark I ran was an 22 and we got a total score of 200,128. Again, still looking on the lower side of things. We beat 1% of all other users. Now it's time to test out a little bit of native Android gaming, and with the lower end stuff, you're going to be good to go. Here's Minecraft. We're at 8 chunks. I do have fancy graphics off, but it's perfectly playable like this. And by the way, I'm using an Xbox One controller connected over Bluetooth. Next on the list, we have Call of Duty Mobile. I'm actually at low settings with the frame rate set to maximum, but I think we're sitting around 45 FPS here. 
Not bad, but this game is actually really good on a lot of different devices that I've tested. And as you can see here, it's definitely playable. Another thing I always like to test on these devices is cloud gaming, be it uh, GeForce Now, Stadia, or even Game Pass, otherwise known as xCloud. Running Forza Horizon 5 here from the cloud, and it seems to be functioning really well. We do have AC Wi-Fi built in, so we can pick up that 5 GHz network, and so far I've had really good luck with cloud gaming on this device. Now it's time to move over to some emulation, and this isn't going to run the higher end stuff. PS2, GameCube, uh, even 3DS, there might be a couple games for each of those that you could play, but you don't go and buy one of these specifically for those emulators. But when it comes to stuff like Dreamcast, which you see running here, Marvel vs. Capcom 2 using the ReDream emulator, it's functioning fine, and anything under this is going to work out really well. You want to do some NES, some Neo Geo, CPS, some PC Engine, even PlayStation 1, this new Tab A8 definitely has enough power for that. Even N64. Here's a harder one to emulate. This is Conker's Bad Fur Day. I'm using the standalone version of Moopin 64 Plus FC from the Google Play Store. And with this, I'm getting really great performance, even with something like GoldenEye 007. And as you can see here, Conker's Bad Fur Day. And finally, for emulation testing, we have PSP using the standalone version of PPSSPP. Here's Tekken 6 using the Vulcan backend at 2x resolution. This isn't the hardest one to emulate, and it isn't the easiest either. I've actually had this struggle on lower end chips, so I figured I'd go ahead and test this one. I also tested a few other easier to emulate games like, like Family Guy and Daxter. I could go up to 3x and 4x with the Vulcan backend on those games. But when it comes to the harder to emulate stuff like Chains of Olympus or Ghost of Sparta, you will have to drop it down to 1x, but I was really surprised at the kind of performance we got. Now you're still going to see some dips down from 60, but overall this is actually pushing through a lot better than I thought it would. I also tried OpenGL, but on this chip Vulcan does perform much better. So in the end, the new Samsung Galaxy Tab A8 10.5 performs similarly to the Amazon Fire 10 that was released in 2021. The GPU they're using in the Amazon Fire 10 does outperform this, but I mean in real world performance, they're really right on par with each other. And both of these tablets do support Widevine, so you will get that HD content. But the Amazon Fire runs Fire OS, and you can always install Google Play, but it doesn't give you that real Android experience like we have here. Now, I know this is skinned over with One UI 3.0, but I've always really enjoyed this. I personally use a Galaxy phone, so I'm used to it. But in the end, it's really up to you. If you can deal with Fire OS and installing Google Play, or not even installing Google Play and using the Amazon App Store, then that's totally up to you. But if I had to make the choice, I would probably go with the tablet that already has Google Play and Android pre-installed out of the box. With this one here, we've got a really snappy experience with Android 11. I love the quad speaker setup. It does get plenty loud for a little tablet like this. But the screen does leave a lot to be desired. I really wish they would have used an IPS instead of a TFT. Viewing angles are still pretty decent here, but throwing an IPS in this would have made all the difference in the world. Battery life is actually pretty decent. Running this on loop, 50% brightness, just a YouTube 1080p video, I got 7 hours and 10 minutes out of it. While gaming, if you're doing something intensive, you can probably expect around 4 hours, you know, continuous use if you were to sit there for 4 hours to kill the battery. It's got a 15 watt quick charging, which really isn't that quick nowadays, but it will get you up much faster than it would if it didn't have any kind of quick charging at all. So yeah, for a low-end, mid-range tablet, it's really not that bad. I have seen these on sale for $199, and if you're interested in picking one up, I would go with that $199 price tag, and that'll get you 32 gigabytes of internal storage and 3 gigabytes of RAM. Or you can up that with the more expensive model with 4 gigs of RAM, 64 gigabytes of storage, or you could spend a little more and get $128. Personally, I'm fine with 4 gigs and 64 gigabytes of storage. If you're interested in learning more, I'm going to leave a few links in the description, but that's going to wrap it up for this one. I really appreciate you watching. If there's anything else you want to see tested on this tablet, just let me know in the comments below. But like always, thanks for watching.